Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And we're going to get into our usual uh, story du jour. But before we do, we have a little bit of housekeeping. We do. Our, I don't even know if I would call it a sibling podcast or, in any case, our yeah. related podcast. It started out as a sibling and then it became its own thing. It's a, Now it's more like a cousin in a good yeah. way. Um, this Day in History class is back with new episodes. If you had ever listened to it and then stopped because you were only getting repeats, Fear not. Uh, there's a new host, uh, Gabriel Luzier, and he is a researcher, and he is taking up the reins of that. So there is new stuff coming out right now. Yeah, Gabe used to work as the uh, lead researcher and a frequent guest on Part-Time Genius. He's also been on Ridiculous History a lot. And he's picked up this podcast with brand new stuff. So Yeah, so if you are are aching for that that little hit of history every day that you maybe had before and haven't had in a bit, Go right back to it. Happy holidays, almost. <laughs> <laughs> Happy October with new This Day in History class, which I think right. might have actually started back with new episodes in September. But still, it's October yes. now. Yes. Uh, welcome, Autumn. It'll be one thing. If you celebrate uh, Thanksgiving, that's a thing you can be thankful for. Uh, so <laughs> Uh, which is kind of a fun thing versus what we are talking about today. We're right in the thick of Halloween season. This is this is it. So uh, I thought this might finally be the time to pull out an episode that I have been tap dancing around for about five years. Uh, so if you have never seen the 1973 horror film The Exorcist, one, I'm so sorry, it's so good. Two, though, you probably know what it is, and you've almost certainly seen images from it. It's so popular that it uh, ends up being spoofed on things all the time. It is, of course, a horror classic, uh, and it won Academy Awards for screenplay and for sound, for sound in particular. Whew, good sound design. Uh, and it was inspired by reports of a possession and exorcism that started in the Washington, D.C. area in 1949. And I say started because it travels a little bit, as you'll hear. And this story really, as we kind of unravel it, becomes as much an examination of psychology and lore as it is of relaying of historical events. And even the veracity of accounts of those events is always in question, uh, this is kind of one of those things where you people either believe it or don't, and there's much argument about it, but it does make for great Halloween discussion. So I wanted to point out there are a couple of things that make this story really difficult to pin down in terms of details. One, it was kept largely secret by the Jesuit priests who were involved in order to protect the identities of the family members who were part of it. And two, this was never a legal case, so there are no government records of it filed in any municipality that people can consult, kind of squirreling around for information wherever they can. And as a consequence of those two things, details have been added, omitted, or just plain relayed incorrectly over the years. And there's also the fact that the fictional version of it, both the book The Exorcist and the movie of the same name, have become so ingrained in horror pop culture that when people think about possession, the imagery from that fiction is often what's foremost in their minds. But the real story is a little bit more tame. So if you saw this and are hoping for details like vomiting pea soup or heads turning 360 degrees... I'll just tell you now, you're going to be disappointed. <laughs> it's not quite any of that. Uh, we're also not really going to relay all of the nitty-gritty here in terms of, like, what played out during the exorcism and, you know, various specific injuries and things that were said. Uh, the focus on this one is really kind of how it all began, how it's been conveyed to the public, and how people have perceived that case in the years since it happened. So the person in this story who was said to have been possessed was a child at the time, he was 14 years old, although that's also reported inconsistently. He was probably 13 at the time. In accounts that were published during these events, he was referred to by a pseudonym that was Roland Doe. And you may also see him referred to by the name Robbie Mannheim, which was a name that was used in the 1993 book on this subject written by Thomas B. Allen. Allen noted in the text that this was a pseudonym, but there seems to have been some confusion over the years uh, because there are some sites that claim that Mannheim was the real name and not a pseudonym that Allen was using. 
Regardless, at this point, the person at the center of this story would be in his mid to late 80s today. So we are just going to stick with calling him Roland Doe. And one thing to note about the priest's diary in this story, which is considered to be the primary source document, is that in many instances, that diary is a recording of certain events as relayed in accounts given by the family. So it's not always necessarily a diary of direct observations, but also notes on the memories of others. This diary also does not note who relayed any of that information, whether it was amalgamated from talking with multiple family members at a time, etc. So even though this one document is often held up as the evidence of everything that happened in this case, that is not an infallible document. And because it has its own lore about where the alleged few copies of it have been kept over the years and who has and hasn't seen it, Even the version that is readily available to the public, which was published as an addendum chapter in that book by Thomas Allen, uh, written in 1993, he subsequently republished it with the, the diary attached. That's not something we can really verify. We just do not have access to touch that document and ensure that it is a real thing. So we're going to reference that account, but keep in mind that we are not claiming it as fact and we can't speak to the veracity of it. One other element of the story that often shifts from one account to another is the location where Roland Doe and his family lived. Sometimes it's listed as being in the D.C. suburb of Mount Rainier, Maryland, and other times it's Cottage City, Maryland. It's easy to see why there might be some discrepancy here. Those two places are really close together, a five-minute car ride or, according to Google Maps, a 24-minute walk In the late 1990s, writer Mark Obsaznik wrote an article that appeared in Strange Magazine, and he detailed his efforts to track down the truth regarding a vacant lot in Mount Rainier that was often said to be the site of the Roland family home. He did some cross-referencing in old phone directories and information on a street renumbering that happened in 1942, and he was slowly able to piece things together. And when he figured out who had been living in the house that had been on the vacant lot in 1949 that many people claimed was the exorcism house, it turned out that the person who had lived there at the time was a widower with no children, definitely not a family with a teenage boy. And the lot being vacant was because that house had been burned down in 1962 as part of a firefighter training exercise long after its resident had died and the dwelling had fallen into disrepair. So pretty normal and boring circumstances, nothing supernatural. Uh, After that, Upsaznik discovered, again, just through looking through public records and kind of connecting dots, that Cottage City was the correct location. Upsaznik mentions two articles from the 1980s that both placed the family home in Mount Rainier and specifically listing the address of the empty lot. But Mount Rainier was mentioned as early as August 1949 in newspaper articles that talked about the exorcism. An article in the New York Daily News dated August 21st, 1949, reads, quote, The boy lives with his parents, non-Catholics, at Mount Rainier, Maryland, near Washington. Mark Upsasnik said that he identified the family, but as other writers have done, he did not divulge that information publicly. And he also stated in that writing that he believed that the priests involved had probably changed the location to add another layer of anonymity for the family. But that false information, plus that empty lot, had led to people to build a lore that was shared both in the oral relay of the story and at times even in the press. So Roland was the son of a federal government worker, and the family on his mother's side was fairly close-knit. Roland was an only child, his grandmother lived with them, and his Aunt Tilly, again, that's a pseudonym, visited pretty frequently from St. Louis Tilly is often referred to as Harriet. Tilly is the name that was used in the priest's diary of the events. We're going to relay those events as they've been laid out by people who say they had access to the diary. So, according to all of this, it's Tilly who is credited with getting Roland interested in the Ouija board game. She is generally described as being interested in spiritualism and as having shared those ideas in lively discussions with her nephew. It is unclear, reading some of these descriptions today, if this is a case of family members kind of playing by indulging in discussions of ghosts and spirits for fun as a curiosity or just an exploration of possibility, 
or if this ant truly believed that spirits could and would communicate or pass from one realm to another. Sometimes she's characterized as like, yes, she believed she was teaching him this. And other times it's like, well, they were kind of playing. <laughs> On January 26, 1949, Aunt Tilly died of complications of multiple sclerosis. And in the days leading up to her death, the family in Maryland reported hearing odd scratching noises in the house. Roland's father attributed this to a rat or a mouse in one of the walls. There was also a strange water drip they could hear in the grandmother's room, both of which the family said stopped the day that Tilly died. Roland kept playing with the Ouija board. His mother believed he was trying to reach Tilly in the afterlife. As this possession story became public, the interpretation of this situation quickly became for many people that Roland had tried to reach out to his aunt with the Ouija board, but instead had contacted a demon. If this was what Roland's mother believed, though, that's a little inconsistent with her behavior. She often asks whatever she thinks might be manifesting if this is Tilly. Yeah, it's a strange thing where it kind of goes back and forth in a lot of the accounts that she thinks there might be some sort of devil situation and also keeps going, Tilly, is that you? <laughs> um, which maybe is indicative of how she perceived her sister, but um, I don't think so. So Roland told his family that he had started hearing the sound of footsteps, specifically squeaky shoes, in his room at night. And so one night, Roland's mother and grandmother went to lie down with him in his room and while they both said that they did not hear it on the night in question, they later both said that they did actually hear the squeaky shoe noise. Both women later conveyed that they had pretended not to hear it to avoid scaring Roland or each other. When they asked if it was Tilly and to knock first three times and then four times a separate time to confirm that it was her, each time they heard the requested number of knocks and felt what was described as a sense of pressure upon them. Then, when they asked for those four knocks and heard them, there were also scratching sounds on the bed. That night, the bed also shook, and the covers were described as standing up stiff and straight around the edges of the bed, as though defying gravity. And then once they were touched, they fell back into a normal position. Roland also experienced a strange event at school not long after this, when his desk started shaking. His teacher told him to stop it, but he insisted he wasn't doing it. More strange but fairly small events were reported by the does, things like hangers flying out of the closets or fruit floating across the room, and even a Bible moving out of a bookshelf allegedly on its own and falling at his feet. Strange things also happened when the family went to other people's homes, including one instance where the chair Roland sitting on starting to spin Roland always maintained that it was not him doing these things, although initially his parents thought he might have learned some kind of sleight of hand from a magic book and decided to trick them all. A doctor and a psychologist who were consulted determined that Roland was a normal kid. They could not find anything unusual. Coming up, we're going to talk about how things unfolded once Roland's family consulted their pastor about what was happening. But first, we are going to take a sponsor break. On February 17th, Reverend Luther Miles Schultz of the St. Stephen's Evangelical Lutheran Church in Washington, D.C., became involved in Roland's case. Roland's mother had turned to their minister for help. And the accounts that the Doe family gave him of increasing severity of the strange phenomena in their house led the pastor to determine that the Doe's should get a psychiatrist more deeply involved in Roland's case. While Schultz prayed with the family over the matter, he didn't seem to think this was a possession, but more likely a young man in need of treatment. He did not immediately share with the family that he thought this may be a scenario not of demonic possession, but one perhaps involving psychokinesis rooted in some sort of psychological issue. The Doe's told the minister that a psychiatrist had already seen their son and that that doctor had said, as we said, he was a normal kid. On the night of February 17, 1949, Reverend Schultz had Roland stay with him overnight so he could observe the boy. Schultz's wife stayed in another room of the house that night. Doe stayed at the Reverend's parsonage for 12 hours, and the minister said he witnessed various phenomena that were the same as what the Doe family had reported. The bed that Roland was trying to sleep on shook. There were scratching noises. 
When Roland moved to a chair, it started moving on its own and it tipped over. When he was moved to the floor, the pallet of blankets that he was trying to sleep on moved around the room. The following week, claw marks started appearing on Roland's body. Reverend Schultz was convinced that this was not just a psychological event and also that he was not equipped to handle the situation. And so he suggested to Roland's mother that they consult a Catholic priest. And that was when they reached out to Father Albert Hughes of St. James Catholic Church. Father Hughes was a young priest in his late 20s. Hughes was pretty surprised to have a Lutheran family asking him for help, and at first he offered some holy water and blessed candles to the Doe's so that they could use them at home. They did, and Mrs. Doe reported back to the priest that the bottle of holy water had flown across the room, and when she tried to light the blessed candles, things around them started to move violently. Father Hughes decided to visit the Doe home himself to see what was really happening, and this is the first instance when Roland is said to have spoken in Latin. He said, quote, O priest of Christ, you know I am the devil. Why do you keep bothering me? So Hughes, at this point believing he might be dealing with a demonic possession, took the case to the Most Reverend Patrick A. O'Boyle, Archbishop of Washington. O'Boyle was sort of unique for a man in his position because he had not actually ever served as a pastor in a church. He had risen through the ranks of the church kind of from a more administrative side. So he did not certainly have a lot of specialized knowledge in possession, and we should point out that most priests did not. (laughs) Uh, He told Hughes to perform the exorcism himself, which was surprising given how young Father Hughes was and how inexperienced he would have been in such matters. And he also told Hughes not to write any of this down so that it would remain secret. One of the measures that Father Hughes took was to have Roland checked into a hospital where he could be restrained. Various episodes and phenomena were happening with increasing severity and frequency. So Roland was admitted to Georgetown Hospital in late February or early March. The admittance appears to have been done in secrecy, so the exact details of this are hard to pin down. Right, there's no paper trail. Equally difficult to sift out are the exact details of what happened once Roland was strapped down and Father Hughes began his exorcism attempt. Accounts vary. Most of those accounts were given after this took place, and we still haven't gotten to the point where the priest's diary was being used to record events as they were happening. So... Again, everything's kind of after the fact. There is a long, persistent detail of the story that Roland was able to get one of his hands free, pull a spring from the bed that he was on, and use it to cut Father Hughes. That detail has been debated and contested. It has also even been attributed to a different part of the timeline. But interviews with students who saw Father Hughes each day in school, because he worked at a Catholic school, suggest that no one saw him with any kind of arm injury during this time. Uh, that's particularly pertinent because he taught physical education, so it wasn't like he could have hidden something like it. Um, And Hughes never said that the injury happened, but that attempted exorcism was abandoned. It ended, and Roland went home. Shortly after this, Roland's mother said that she saw words form in blood on her son's skin, This is something that none of the clergy or doctors ever corroborated, although they did witness some strange rashes on his body. According to Mrs. Doe's account, during the time right after Georgetown, when she and her husband were discussing taking Roland to St. Louis for help, that was a place where they both had family, the words Louis, Saturday, and three and a half weeks appeared on his abdomen, hip, and chest, respectively. Pastor Schultz discouraged the St. Louis trip and wanted the Doe's to check Roland into a hospital so he could be cared for uh, by a doctor he had selected who had been fully briefed on the boy's condition. The Doe's opted against this, and they left for St. Louis on March 5th. There is actually a letter that exists in an archive of Pastor Schultz writing to someone and saying, like, I really wish they would just do what I'm asking them to because I really think... This kid needs a doctor that is sympathetic to this case and some psychological help. And instead, they're like, nope, we're going to go to St. Louis. That seems like the right move. And you can hear his frustration in that letter. According to the Doe's, they stayed first with one set of relatives and then another, kind of debating what to do. And Roland continued to have words appear on his skin, often, according to Mrs. Doe, 
answers to questions that she posed. For example, when she suggested to her son that they might enroll him in school in St. Louis with his cousin, the words no school are said to have appeared on his chest. There is no official record of this or evidence. It was in St. Louis that another cousin of Roland's, who was enrolled at St. Louis University, contacted a Jesuit priest at the school. That was Father Raymond J. Bishop. In turn, Father Bishop consulted with Father Lawrence J. Kinney, who suggested that they also loop in the school's president, Father Paul Reinert. Reinert told Bishop to go to the home where Roland was staying, give a blessing, and observe the situation. He made this visit to the home of Roland's uncle, where the family was staying on the night of March 9th. After meeting with the family and Roland and hearing their accounts of what had happened since January, Bishop blessed each room of the house, and he pinned what's called a second-class relic, meaning something that a saint had touched, of St. Margaret Mary to a pillow on the bed in the room Roland was staying in. After the boy went to bed, the bed started moving, banging around. Father Bishop saw this and later said that the boy was perfectly still during all of this, indicating that he was not in some way causing this movement. The priest sprinkled holy water on the bed, and then zigzag scratches were said to have appeared on Roland's abdomen. Eventually, the motion of the bed stopped, and the family was able to settle down for the night. The next day, Father Bishop reached out to 52-year-old Father William S. Bowdern of the St. Francis Xavier Church. Two nights after Bishop's first visit to the home, he returned, this time with Father Bowdern, who brought with him another holy relic. This was a fragment of bone from the arm of St. Francis Xavier. Father Bowdern also started a dossier-style study of Roland and his family. The incidents with Roland continued, and when the priests were there, they would pray over him until the situation subsided. In some cases, the family reported large furniture moving, sometimes blocking the door to the room where Roland was, but Fathers Bishop and Bowdern came to the determination that they needed to go to the Archbishop of St. Louis, Father Joseph Ritter, to make the case that an exorcism was needed. Neither of them felt qualified to perform the ritual, so they were asking the Archbishop to also select an exorcist. So we should be clear that this kind of request to the archbishop has some layers. Uh, For one, acquiescing to such a request would likely meet with a great deal of skepticism from the community and church members who believed that the idea of possession was something from centuries gone by before humans had made strides in understanding things like mental illness. It could very easily damage the reputation of the church. For another, if it was a case of mental illness, attempting an exorcism would likely only make the situation worse for a person who should be getting treatment from a medical professional. And then there was just the possibility that regardless of whether this was some sort of psychological issue or on the outside chance it was something supernatural, approving an exorcism just automatically put a priest in jeopardy for, like, literal violence. Ritter is said to have given approval for the exorcism, but named Bowdern as the one to perform it, insisting that the matter be discussed with no one else. So a note on the attribution of the priest's diary here. Sometimes it's attributed to Father Bowdern, but credit is sometimes given to Father Bishop. Father Bishop did conduct interviews with the family, and he took notes, but Bowdern started the file on the Doe family and Roland's case, Bowdern later stated, though, that because he had found so little information on dealing with possession cases that he asked Bishop to record everything that happened so that any future cases might have some sort of literature to access. Bowdern did involve one more person, though, uh, despite being asked to not discuss it with anyone, and that was Walter Halloran. Halloran is often mentioned as a priest when this story is relayed, but though he was a Jesuit starting in 1941, he was not ordained as a priest until the mid-1950s, so he was not a priest at this time. Initially, Father Bowdern told the 26-year-old Halloran, who was a friend and a former student, that he needed a ride to a house. Uh, And it was not until they arrived at the home of Roland's relatives that he was told that they were performing an exorcism, and that Halloran would need to help hold the boy involved down. Their arrival there, which was March 16th, was also the first time that the family was told that an exorcism was planned. Coming up, we'll talk about the exorcism itself and how this story made its way into the press. But first, we are going to take a break and hear from the sponsors that keep Stuff You Missed in History Class going. The 
exorcism started with prayers said by the entire family, including Roland. And then Father Bowdern began to read from the Roman ritual. That's the book that contains all of the services a priest may be called to perform. Every priest has one. As Bowdern spoke the prayers of the ritual, Roland's body began to react, according to the diary account, with words appearing on his skin, including the words hell and go. So at this point, other people did say they saw them. And from there... That night spiraled into stages of Roland having sort of fitful sleep and then having violent outbursts, which required two men at a time to hold him down. That's of note because Roland was always described as a very slight boy who was physically worn down from weeks of lack of sleep. He also sang garbled renditions of Old Man River and Swanee while he slept. Later on, some other songs made it into the repertoire. And then at 7.30 in the morning, he fell into what is described as a, quote, natural sleep. For the next month, things played out similarly every night, and they escalated in intensity. At times, he would urinate or use foul language or spit or exhibit what was called, quote, violence and demonical fighting. And that was how it was described in the diary. After five nights of this, the decision was made to move Roland to the Alexian Brothers Hospital in a room as far as possible from other patients so that his family could have some peace The sleeplessness and strain were really taking a toll at this point. That only lasted one night, though, as it really scared the child to be there when he was uh, in his more, you know, typical or normal nonviolent state, and he spent another night at his uncle's house and then moved to the rectory at College Church, where he stayed for several nights. During these nights, the rites of exorcism continued with similar violent reactions. During this time, he was also given lessons about Catholicism with the intent that he would be baptized. Yeah, the hope was that if they baptized him as a Catholic, everything was going to work a little bit better. So for several days, things were actually calm with no incidents. They had a little ray of hope, but once again, the pattern began on April 1st. Father Bowdern hastily baptized Roland with an abbreviated version of the normal ceremony because Roland was in and out of possessed episodes. So like the some of the the responses that he had to give verbally, he wasn't himself, for lack of a better phrase, long enough to be able to do them. So that's why they did a very short version. The following morning, Roland received communion with great resistance. Father Bishop and another priest, Father O'Flaherty, assisted Father Bowdern, and afterwards, they drove Roland back to his uncle's house. While they were driving, Roland attacked O'Flaherty, who was driving on the way. He had to be forcefully pulled away so they could safely finish the trip. This is one of those things, Was this is the least of the questions associated with all of this. But uh, does, does the diary or any other document say anything about whether his parents had given permission for him to be baptized? Uh, yeah, the family appeared to have agreed to it, yes. Okay. Uh, this is a question that occurred to me, and at the same time, I was like, this is an interesting question to be the one question that has arisen in my mind at this I, moment. I, I, If you read any of the accounts, by that point, uh, they and his mother in particular were so desperate, they probably would have gone along with any plan so long as someone was offering to help them because they f- felt like they had been asking for help and getting told, like, no, he's normal the whole time. Uh, so to have someone actually, like, we're going to figure this out, they were like, okay, whatever you say. So these episodes, they still persisted. The exorcism was not considered complete, but the Doe family returned to the Washington, D.C. area on April 4th, and Father Bowdern and a Father Van Roo accompanied them there. The reason for this travel was so Roland's father could go back to work. The train trip was uneventful. Once Father Bowdern was in Maryland, he connected with Father Hughes, and the two priests attempted to find a D.C. area hospital that would take Roland, but none would for various reasons, including the fact that the request to keep an admittance of a minor off the books for secrecy was deeply problematic. On April 9th, Roland was taken back to St. Louis and admitted once again to Alexi and Brothers Hospital. Travel was once again peaceful, and once he was settled back in the hospital, the priests began repeating the exorcism ritual as the boy exhibited the same reactions we've been talking about already in varying degrees. On the night of April 18th, one day after Easter Sunday, things were in a state of extremes. Roland was intent on praying whenever he wasn't in the middle of an episode, but these episodes, which were sometimes being described as seizures in the priest's notes, were particularly intense and violent, and he lashed out at them. 
Then just before 11 p.m., there was a vocalization from the boy that stated that it was St. Michael commanding Satan to leave. Then there was a particularly violent convulsion that lasted between seven and eight minutes, which is an extraordinarily long time. When that was over, Roland stated, he's gone. He then described an angel appearing to him in a blinding light and confronting the devil, and the devil and multiple minions retreating into a pit. The next morning, Roland felt normal when he was awake. He went to Mass for the first time, and then just shy of two weeks later, he went back to Maryland and resumed his life. In an addendum note in the diary, it is written that Roland's parents also converted to Catholicism, but that didn't happen until December 1950. I cannot imagine, like, watching a child having this... Convulse for for that long? For that long. That's so long. That would break me. I'm not a kid's person, and that would break me. Yeah. Uh, I have various questions. Once a priest gave a lecture at the Mount Pleasant Library in Washington, D.C. to the Society of Parapsychology in which he told the story of Roland's alleged possession. When that happened, it started getting press coverage. From the start of these details being shared with the public, though, things were really inconsistent. While some of the details could be considered inconsequential, like descriptions of the Doe home, uh, those were all over the place, Those inconsistencies indicate some problematic coverage of the case. While some details were purposefully obscured to try to keep the family's identity private, that meant that journalists sometimes filled in details based on presumption or conjecture. And as different journalists covered the story, more and more of it became harder to pin down. Yeah, at the time, uh, the condition of that priest giving that, that lecture... Uh, was that he not be named. Eventually, it came out that it was Father Schultz. Um, The Catholic Church never made an official statement regarding the nature of what happened to Roland Doe. Walter Halloran said later in his life, quote, I should never feel comfortable or capable of making an absolute statement. And one detail that often comes up as an unanswered question in this case is that Roland was said to have spoken Latin to the priest during the exorcism. We mentioned it earlier in the episode, and that's a language he had never studied or had prior knowledge of. But Halloran gave an account that kind of counters that. He said that he thought the boy was just repeating phrases that he had already heard the father say in the exorcism ritual. When writer William Peter Blatty reached out to Father Bowdern 20 years after the incidents in the diary, he was clear that he wanted to write a book about what had happened. Blatty had been a student at Georgetown University when the exorcism had appeared in the papers, and he was hoping to get a firsthand account from the priest. And while Bowdern wrote back to Blatty that he and a colleague had kept a detailed diary of everything that happened, he also said he had been instructed by church officials to keep the case out of the public eye and that he could not share those materials. As we've already mentioned, they were intended as research only for the eyes of other religious figures who might face a demon possession case. He was also worried about the young man involved in the events and maintaining his privacy and safety. So even though he didn't have an account from Bowdern, Blatty, of course, wrote the book anyway. He did change the possessed child uh, in his story to a girl instead of a boy and shifted some other details and turned up the dramatic aspects of it considerably. Uh, One of the things that often comes up is those changes in voice that are very striking in the film when Reagan suddenly speaks in a completely different and demonic voice. Those were never part of Roland's case, for example. And when the book was published in 1971, it was an instant sensation. In 1974, after the movie had come out, remember it came out in 73, Blatty published the book William Peter Blatty on the Exorcist from novel to film. And in that, he includes drafts of the script for the film, as well as the background story on his interactions with clergy involved and his decision to change the main character to a girl as part of his his desire to meet with their uh, request to maintain anonymity. Now, he says in that book that there are five copies of the diary that was kept by Bowdern and Bishop, uh, and that two of those copies were in different archdioceses, two were held by people who had been involved in the case, and that one was in the hospital where Roland Doe had been cared for. Those numbers don't add up with how many copies of this diary show up around around the world later or people claim to have seen. Uh, So there are apparently other copies, but at that time, those were all that Blatty knew about. As for Roland Doe's life after the exorcism, 
when writer and investigator Mark Upsasnik started looking into this story in the 1990s, he interviewed a man named Dean Landolt, who had been friends with Father Hughes. Landolt said that the priest had told him that Roland Doe graduated from Gonzaga High School and, quote, turned out fine. Upsasnik also interviewed people he had tracked down from Roland's neighborhood, most of whom described the boy as a bratty troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are all kinds of stories you'll hear about what happened to him later in his life, and uh, including, like, maybe that he worked for NASA, which is kind of funny to me, but uh, maybe he did, I don't know. But it, they're all over the place because nobody can verify them, so nobody can say, no, you're wrong. Uh, what is less commonly mentioned in articles about Roland Doe's story is the interest in it that followed in the summer of 1949 on the part of parapsychologists. In August 1949, the story that a teenage boy had been freed from demonic possession was reported in several papers in the U.S. with headlines like, Case of Haunted Boy Baffling to Scientists. This is all kind of related to that lecture that was given by a, an, an at-the-time unnamed priest uh, about this case. At that point, the president of the Society of Parapsychology, Richard C. Darnell, relayed the information that aligned with Father Schultz's night of observations of Roland's situation at the Lutheran Rectory. But it seems as though the Society of Parapsychology did not publish any additional conclusions about the case. Although I did find an article not long after that about Richard C. Darnell and how he's the person you want to call if you have any sort of paranormal thing going on. Which makes me go, huh, that worked out for you. Uh, but, <laughs> but we don't have any any of the scientific research that was sort of, uh, not promised, but suggested might be coming. So, Well, and I feel like we should also just point out that even though parapsychology sounds like psychology, which is a medical field, that's not what parapsychology is. It's like the study of alleged not necessarily substantiated phenomena, right? Yeah, th it's basically anything that happens in the realm of mental phenomena mm -hmm. that can't be explained by what would be considered orthodox scientific psychology. Right. So had they published findings, it, it would not necessarily have been findings that came about from, like, the scientific method. Right. Not like, we did an MRI and found something that would explain some strange behavior. Nothing like that happened, to the best of our knowledge. This is such a fascinating thing, and I will talk in our um, our behind the scenes about how th I associate this entire story with my childhood for oh, yeah. a variety of reasons. One being that this was a very popular topic of discussion at my house growing up. <laughs> <laughs> but since that is a, a strange and many question marks kind of thing. I thought we should end, uh, since we are in Halloween season, talking about something delicious and fun in our listener mail. Yeah. So, <laughs> so this is an email from our listener who just signs it with the letter A, who said, I had your podcast recommended to me by a friend after mentioning that I listen to Stuff You Should Know. I've been listening ever since and find your deep dives into different topics to be fascinating and a lot of fun to listen to. This morning, I listened to the episode you did about the history of waffles and wanted to take time to email you guys and thank you for the episode. I had no idea that they go back so far, nor had any idea about their origins. I found it quite interesting that what we know as Belgian waffles are actually quite younger than I thought they were. My partner and I have Liège waffles, the ones with the pearl sugar, and they are made in Belgium, every week after our drinking night as a hangover breakfast, either regular or chocolate chip. We have them warm, toasted between the plates of our sandwich toaster. She has them with raspberry jam, and I have them with blackberry or raspberry jam and natural peanut butter. That might sound strange, but believe me, it goes perfect with coffee. Although I have had them straight out of the pack before, and they are just as good that way, too. I live in Australia, so waffles are seen more as a dessert item here, though you can also find them for breakfast in some restaurants. As such, they are rarely, if ever, served a la chicken and waffle style, but usually with fruit, syrup, butter, and or ice cream. Thanks for your podcast. It keeps me both entertained and informed in my little corner of the world, which is Perth, on my almost daily walks and commutes. I love to learn things about history, even if it's obscure or just reminding me of something I already knew about. I look forward to listening to more episodes in your archives as time goes on. Thank you so much for this email. I love talking about waffles. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I believe that waffles with jam and peanut butter would be amazing as a breakfast. Yeah. Into it. I'm into it. Let's do it. Um, and I'm glad you're with us and listening. And hopefully we'll have more 
fun food things that delight you. Now I want waffles really bad. I had chicken and waffles quite recently. Yum. Um, <laughs> if you would like to write to us, you can do so at History Podcast at iHeartRadio.com. You can also find us on social media as Missed in History. And if you haven't subscribed, there's no time like the present. You can do that on the iHeartRadio app or wherever it is you listen. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.